The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Well, as we wrapped up Thursday's market trade action, lead month soybeans tried to test above 1250, couldn't hold it on the day while we did find some late session support in Minneapolis and KC wheat futures, a little bit in Chicago wheat too. Corn market firm, little pressure in livestock, outside markets found some pressure, kind of mixed on the day. Uh, let's talk about it. Joining us for a conversation Brian Doherty, Senior Market Advisor at Total Farm Marketing, is with us here again this week. Brian, good to catch up with you and um, felt kind of mixed on Thursday. Maybe some of that's positioning, traders not wanting uh, big positions on heading into a holiday weekend. I'm not sure. Just felt kind of mixed and quiet, uh, really across the board, uh, but especially starting with the grain trade, kind of felt that way through Thursday's session. It, it did, and you didn't have a whole lot of new news. Now, we did have a good export sales number in corn at $36 million, um, so that puts total $1.940 billion. Last year at this time, $1.595, so just round up to $1.5, and we're about 445 million bushels more than a year ago at this time. So real steady in the bean or on the corn exports. Uh, beans, uh, I think the market was looking for a little more. 10.3 was today's number. So that was new news. And then wheat was kind of uh, 0.7 on old crop, 8.3 new crop. So not, not a lot on the export front to really give the muscle uh, to the market that maybe some were hoping for. To your point, you've got a three-day weekend just ahead. Uh, on a positive note, I was looking at July wheat here on the close, and it did, this is a new high close for this rally, uh, which is encouraging because two days ago, we had this real big spike high and a real poor finish. And mm -hmm. uh, to turn around and come back here, like we did that supportive, uh, all attention still focusing on the Black Sea region and what world supplies might look like there. Uh, but to your point, not a lot of activity today. Cattle were a little bit of a snoozer uh, finishing down um, 50 to 60 points in the front months. Hogs were a little defensive again, 50 to 80 down in feeder cattle. Not surprising, down about 80 to a buck 40. You had some weakness in the live cattle, and then you had a little bit higher corn prices today. Um, and probably enough to keep feeders defensive after a pretty good rally here. Uh, lead month soybean futures at 1250 mark. I, I think we got up to about 1258 on Thursday, right around there. Just couldn't hold it. We found selling again. When you look at that chart, I mean, it, it just feels like we don't have enough fresh news to your point uh, for us to sustain a rally above that pivotal 1250 kind of swing point here in July soybeans, Brian. You know, you're you're right. So th th this morning's high was uh, 12.58 and a quarter, but the um, the close was 12.39. So well well off the high, right? And the last high we had on May 7th was 12.56 and a half. So you kind of got this double top. You still have what I would term a very interesting pennant formation that points to higher. And the key from here would be suggesting that beans need to not only get above let's say in july 1282 uh but they need to get back up to a gap area that was left on december 29th and that's that's around that 13 uh let's call it 1311 mark there so so there's a good technical picture kind of a disappointing day though had a good good thing going in it and the double top I, I want to believe that what you're seeing really is just a marketplace that's that kind of the second half of the day went a little lethargic into what's going to be a, a long weekend. Well, and maybe to some farmers selling, I think especially a lot of Brazilian farmers got beans to sell on this rally. They sell off the U.S. market. Uh, maybe even some U.S. farmers as well have some old crop or they're looking at new crop positioning, things like that. I And, and also, too, I know we got these rumors about Soybean sales to China for the July-August window, but then China's got a blockade of Taiwan, so you throw some geopolitical worry in there, too. And yeah. all, all that together, I think, maybe adds to some of that lethargicness uh, that we saw in the uh, soy trade on Thursday, Brian. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point with the Taiwan news, and I, you know, so is a trader really going to step in front of this? You, you got to be really bullish or think that, well, that's 
that's one bit of news, but it really doesn't have impact. I don't know. I, th I think everything kind of has some sense of impact right now because it's about money flow and what's the money doing. Um, the six to 10 day forecast for what it's worth, we had seven in a row that had the entire Midwest above normal precipitation. And then we had three in a row uh, that said, mm, that's so quick on the West. So it turned a little bit drier West. Now that flipped a little bit here to, to more normal. Um, but the point of it is, is that at that farmers are going to continue to try and make some progress here, but it's a big issue, this planning delay. Uh, and I say it's a big issue because there's certain ground in states right now that they're already up against the prevent plant date if they so choose. And I talked to a couple of North Dakota farmers today, we did, and they told us that they're going to do something different with some of this corn ground, whether they take the insurance payment or maybe plant a different crop and not be insured. Probably both. I'll take that one step further. I was talking to a farmer friend in uh, north central, northwest Iowa yesterday, and he kind of mentioned the same thing that, that with the rain, they had five, five and a half inches of rain uh, north of Algona, Iowa here mm -hmm. uh, with some of these storms earlier this week. And he mentioned that He's already replanted some low spots a couple times, but with all this rain in some of these areas, how much nitrogen, how much N has been washed away, that's something here as well that maybe could contribute to some soybean acres, uh, you know, some corn acres going over to soybeans here potentially as we, you know, move this calendar closer to the month of June. I, I think there are some concerns there for sure, Brian. There are, and, and, and to be to be clear, this is not, we're not talking the majority of the crop, but we're talking, according to the USDA, that last 30%, and some of that got punched in pretty hard, so it's the last 15%, 10%, 5%. There will be some breaks in some of the weather here out west here in the after the weekend probably. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not ideal. So, I, so one way to sort of clump conditions are the ideal or less than ideal. The, the corn market as a whole has been struggling with less than ideals now for six weeks. It's less than ideal for six weeks. Meeks makes me wonder here if the USDA isn't going to, uh, on the next report in June, sort of take a preliminary shot at lowering the yield a little bit on big picture perspective. It's just hard to, hard to argue that the yield should hold or move higher. You got to have just about ideal conditions and it hasn't been anywhere close to just about ideal for um, enough percentage that it matters. Well, I think, too, with the corn market, it's been fairly firm. I, that same farmer I was talking to mentioned this, and we've kind of seen some localized basis pushes here in recent days, Brian, in terms of, you know, uh, some folks maybe, I know in his case, got some 480 corn sold, and, and some guys and gals took it. So, I mean, I think that's another aspect here that some folks are, are playing with is if they're getting a decent local basis push, they're maybe – making some marketing decisions here with this last percentage of the crop left uh, to get in the ground. Absolutely. And that keeps the corn market somewhat, uh, let's say, uh, with a wet rag over it. Okay. So we had a good punch here. Uh, look like, man, we could go up and fill some of these gaps and do some of these things in the charts that looked like we were just a day or two or three away. And I'm talking May 15th. And not uh, that day, the market peaked peaked and then it flipped back down and then the market kind of rallied back up corn had an actually decent close considering the range of prices so i think what capped that rally is is just a lot of farmers selling there's a lot of corn out there that was unpriced that isn't committed it's sitting there and farmers have to figure out what they do and it's human nature when one or two do it 102 are doing it. So I think that's what happened at that juncture. Um, and and now the market's trying to get a footing. I, I, I'd i like to think, think that the corn chart has a little bit room to run here, at least go up and fill some gaps from the end of the calendar year. Um, and in December, new crop corn, that's it. Oh, we, I call it the 502 area. Just that's about, about where it is. A gap is a space that's left in the chart. And for instance, on December corn, the gap is uh, 503 is the high side of the gap. And the low side of the gap is 502 and one quarter. But they're targets for the market to try and get to, Jesse. So we're, all, we're within striking range, but we have to get something to kind of 
give it another boost. And I think Corn just didn't have any more new news this week that could give it that boost. Brian Doherty, Senior Market Advisor at Total Farm Marketing, joining us here today on Market Talk. Brian, let's uh, look at livestock. You mentioned the cattle market Thursday, kind of a snoozer. I have to think that maybe we're, we're finally getting some of that positioning for the cattle on feed report coming up Friday. You look at those estimates, uh, on feed estimate as of May 1st, 99.1%. Placements, 93.3%. Marketing's at 109.5%. So, I mean... Some of those numbers come to fruition. I'll be curious to see how the trade reacts to that or if we get it all priced in ahead of time or see the reaction as we get back to trading on Tuesday, Brian. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what it, what it looks like. But I, I don't expect that you're going to see. I mean, we've, we've had, you know, 18 months we've been talking about cattle and feed reports, their lower placements and those type of things. And they, they all have come basically uh, it, to, to bear fruit. Uh, but from month to month, you might see some aberrations. The placement number is the key here. That is as low as the market's anticipating. I think that rationalizes and justifies the deferred live cattle futures markets in February of next year, 190, April 192.40. Those are some really hefty, good numbers. That's getting back up to the territory where the market peaked last fall. So, my encouragement is for producers who are, if that's relevant, Make sure you're watching those contracts really closely. Uh, there's good demand under the market. I'm just worried that there won't be great demand, in particular at higher prices. I know, too, uh, seeing this on Thursday, just some of the cash activity, some northern <laughs> bids out there, uh, some of the northern northern feedlots, uh, 305 on a dressed basis is kind of the mm -hmm. asking price, and some of those bids are – just below it, 300 to 302. And so watch this cash market and the continued support from box B, for instance, things like that. I'm I'm also keeping an eye on all of that here as we head to the holiday weekend, Brian. Yeah, the cattle have a lot going for it right now and a lot of activity and a lot of just movement. Let's call it movement. And so this is all, uh, these are all things, I guess I should say, that is, um, that's all part of the mix here. I was trying to... Uh, you know, reiterate before just how significant I think that placement number is if it's if it's that tight. Now, the good news is that that should provide support for the back months of cattle. The bad news is if you're a corn producer, it's confirming that this herd's pretty tight. So it doesn't look like we're seeing all of a sudden a big expectation for the herd to expand. You'd have to retract uh, or retrate, uh, pull back some heifers, keep them in place. That exasperates that supply side from the beef side it'll be interesting though to see what it looks like for weekend disappearance i think most of the midwest is okay in the weather spotty rains but not real warm in temperature so i don't think it's going to be a good grilling season yet the market kind of rallied up in there uh here, up into that these upper territories the last two weeks uh but i wouldn't be surprised if we're trying to find a top in the market Hogs, you mentioned uh, that hog market just continues to kind of slug its way lower. Any notes in the uh, pork side of the trade today? You know, the, the, the thing is, is you've got okay demand, but you've got a lot of inventory. Daily slaughters are fairly large. You've got a poor technical looking picture right now. We slipped under 100. Um, you have a lot of confidence in the market, but confidence doesn't buy the market. <laughs> when I say confidence, we look at where we are now. We're at the same price that the market was back in February, but it was working its way higher then, uh, and then put in a double peak or double top in early April, um, $14 higher than where the market is right now. So, so it's a disappointment to see the market give up so much. But at these kind of high prices, and when you look at tight beef supplies and other inventories, uh, you're going to get a lot of movement in a lot of sectors. Um, it, it's just almost ironic that cattle have been moving upward and, and hogs down when the better value is in the hogs. So I'm not a bear on hogs, but they've they've already you know moved to where I concerned myself could be the case. But I think big picture, you got to be somewhat supportive now at hog prices. Uh, now I'm going to say well below 100 now, 97.47 is where the where the July contract finished today. About the dairy market, any notes for us there this week? <laughs> yeah, a lot of volatility, a lot of movement. We had some limit moves um, today looking at a market that really tried to punch it right back up and sort of say, well, it's not over yet. 
but right now barely hanging on to gains in the in the June contract 2002 uh, with today's high at 2034 but a market there that really spiked and that goes back to sort of this you know get your orders in mentality you never know what a market might spike and then it's done and I'm not saying the milk market's done but here on the 20th we had a high of 2182 on the on the June milk and today's low was was 20 um, or 1980. So, so what's that? 20 and a buck, it's a buck 20 and then another, uh, Jesse, another 82. So it's a, it's a, basically it's a, it's a $2 swing uh, in just days. So mm -hmm. get your orders in. Uh, I don't see beef prices. I don't see dairy prices at elevated levels. Like, like dairy has been at $20 plus generating new demand and that's that's the problem with the dairy and the beef industry right now it, it, you only have so much demand to go around and you're not going to create more demand at higher prices brian always appreciate the time final thoughts anything else for us here you want to share or reiterate today well, i'd say just just keep vigilant look for opportunities uh what we saw in the milk market here is we had a handful of farmers that we talked to and we said well let's get our wish orders up there and by golly, they got their wish orders filled. The market quickly reversed. So, but the wish orders made good sense for the farm operation to be hedging. So, same thing in corner beans here. Don't be hesitant to put orders higher. You never know. And sometimes they, those orders get filled in days where you have a very strong looking market, and you're kind of wondering why you're you had those in there and you're sold. And yet by the close or the end of the week or end of the month, everything's reversed. And down it goes, and you thank your lucky stars that you had the ability to kind of put that order in there. So price orders, I guess that's my theme this week. Get price orders in at levels that you know you'd be willing to sell at. Don't cancel them as the market gets there, rationalizing the news. Just keep them in. Brian, if folks want to reach out to you and ask questions and more, I know they can get a hold of you very easily there at Total Farm Marketing. How can they get in touch with you? They sure can. Uh, first, give us a call, 800-334-9779. Or uh, email Brian with a Y, so B R Y N at totalfarmmarketing.com or check out our website, totalfarmmarketing.com. Brian, have a fantastic weekend. Thank you for joining us as always. We'll talk to you again next week. Jesse, thank you. Much appreciate it. That's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online at markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great rest of your day. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube.